How are people going to go through this? Because crisis leadership is not an event. It's not a one-off thing. We don't just do crisis leadership and go, jobs are good and we're done now. Let's go home and have some tea. It's kind of like, no, actually, this is an ongoing process and it's going to go on for a while as things shift and change and uncertainty continues to rise. So I thought there was three things that we really have to help people go through. And that's self-leadership, the hardest person you ever lead is yourself. And it's also leadership of people in your family, or it might be a friend, or it might be a neighbor, or it might be a whole corporate business. Influencing the thinking of billions of people every year, they are the thought leaders, educators, and extroverts. Meet the minds behind the microphones, the experts who share from the stage, encouraging us to think differently, do more, and ultimately strive to succeed. Welcome to the Hashtag Keynote Speaker Show. Here's your host, Jonathan Creek. There we go, a bit of a bumpy intro, but we are up and away now. Let me introduce you to Drew Povey, all the way from the UK. Here we go. There we go. Hello, Drew. Welcome to the show. How are we doing? Very good, mate. Thank you for staying up late UK time to join us on the Hashtag Keynote Speaker Show. Pleasure. Uh, it's so good to have you on, um, and it's early morning here, obviously, so welcome to the future. Hope you enjoy what you see on the other side of your uh, your sleep coming up. How are you? Yeah, well, yeah, doing all right. You can see it's pitch black out here. It's, it's night time, so it's... Uh, Probably slightly past my bedtime as well, to be honest, Jonathan. Doesn't it go pitch black at about four o'clock in the afternoon in the UK? Steady on. We're not <laughs> we're not coming up quite as bad as Iceland. Uh, no, we're doing all right at the moment. The clocks went forward or back, whichever way it goes. So we're 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 now getting sunlight probably until about half seven, eight o'clock. So yeah, we're we're all good. And it's been pretty warm over here today. Well, really? as warm as it gets probably over here in the north of England. What are we talking? 15 degrees? 16 degrees? Yeah, yeah, we might be topping out at 16, I reckon. Okay, no worries. That was our overnight low, but that's all right. Yeah, we won't rub <laughs> that in. <laughs> now, Drew, uh, before we uh, before we get into the um, into the topic and, and what you're all about as a speaker and where you've come from and what you... Uh, what drives you as your purpose, and then some tips that you can give some people in these times. Uh, firstly, I just want to ask you, how is the UK going uh, with COVID-19? Uh, what's the situation and the feeling over there uh, amongst the people of the street? Because you are a man of the people. We know that. Yeah, well, I'm quite saying the man of the people. We're not really a, 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 a doing anything other than being locked down at the moment, which, is, of course, is the right call. I mean... The, it's a it's a worrying time. I, th I think people are scared um, about what actually is going to play out. I think people are really worried about whether the NHS can cope, and we just don't really know enough about it. I think there's there's more stuff you read on social media where people are starting to ask questions about how, kind of how bad is this, and then when you see the death rate kind of increasing, um, and the periods of lockdown are talking about being months rather than weeks. It just starts to feel a little bit uncertain. Um, and I think when you, whenever you make any change initially, probably people will go with it um, and they'll probably say, well, I think, I think we'll be all right for a week or two. We can stay indoors. We can do this. We can homeschool our kids. How difficult can this be? Uh, I think as time goes on, the challenge becomes more. And as the weather's getting nice outside, I think some people are looking to get outside the houses a little more as well. So I think there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, the vast majority of people, I'd say, are concerned. I think they are looking to keep themselves healthy, well and safe. Um, but like any walk of life, I suppose, any culture in any country, there are some people that just don't seem to listen to the warnings that they're given and seem to try and live their lives as, as, as they want to, which is, is perhaps not helpful. And that's a really important point. We've just been announced, it's just been announced here anyway, yesterday, um, and you come from an education background, that the whole of second semester, so term two here in Australia, uh, particularly in Victoria, is going to be homeschooled. 
Now, I'm married to a teacher. Uh, you're from an education background, as I said, so you would understand yeah. the stress that comes with that. Um, uh, my beautiful wife, she is now facing uh, what, 11 weeks of teaching preps, so five-year-olds online, yeah. uh, and then all the worries that come with that, like you know, how do you assess the kids properly, how do you write reports, Um but I think that announcement had a secondary effect on society that this thing ain't going to be over by Easter. Yeah. I mean, I think I think what what people initially tried to do was say, look, if we can get as close to Easter as possible, shut some of the schools down, buy ourselves a bit of time, I'm sure we can get it under control the two weeks before Easter in the UK, the two weeks of Easter, quite a few people take holidays at that time. In a month, we should be able to get this nailed. I think we're realising now as we kind of come to the third week that that's probably not going to be the case. So it's the reality of that kicking in. Um, I've seen lots of interesting posts on social media, people saying I've done one day of homeschooling and think um, every teacher in the world should be paid £1 million every year for, for the incredible job they do because it's not easy. I know it well, you know, if you're married to a teacher, you would agree. But, it, you know, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a testing time. It's really hard, isn't it? And if you've not got the skills to educate young people, then it's, it's hard. And particularly if you've got teenagers at home and you'll be dealing with uh, the hormone hothouse that is or are the teenage years, it's, it's going to be a bit of a wrestle for, for some people. So there's an awful lot going on. And what I'd say is it's, it's one of those times when there seems to be a lot of moving parts. I think as human beings, we're reasonable at being able to deal with one or two things that come up. But because there's so much uncertainty coming our way at the moment, it's trying to uh, work that out. It's trying to work a way through that. And it's trying to understand it when there is so much uncertainty around, whether that's educating the kids, whether that's are we going to be working, who can work, who can't work, should we be going to work, is it safe to work, what is the best health advice that we can do. There's, there's a lot of things that we're having to try and understand at the moment. And, you know, we're not good at multitasking. We know that much, even though some people think they are. We're better at focusing on one thing at a time. And when you can't do that, and we're being forced not to do that, it's probably not going to be the easiest time for a lot of people. So I think there's some testing times ahead. I think that's an interesting point that you're touching on. And, and, and I just want to explore it a little bit further if we can. The human race is so set on changing everything like we are in a cycle of change like history's never seen before with technology and all these yeah. sorts of things but when there's a change that we didn't plan it's like we almost all fall apart um oh yeah how do you well, approach that well this is the interesting thing isn't it i mean people say humans like change i i really don't think they do i mean it's the it's the age-old saying isn't it the only people that like change is a baby with a dirty nappy. <laughs> now, I've had three boys, and I can assure you that even when they had a dirty nappy, they didn't like change. <laughs> and and it's, a, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's something we have to get our head around because change is coming. I mean, you know, the world changes all the time, whether we like it or not. We get that horrible, tired phrase that change is our constant. It is our constant. But I don't think we like it, and I think we get comfortable and what I found working in a whole range of industries from elite sport to education to private business to working with the police and the NHS, even the most miserable people you will meet. I mean, you know, those people that literally suck the life out of you when you have a conversation with them, the mood hoovers that uh, mood lots of people hoovers. talk about. You know, they, well, they, they, you know they, they're, they're the kind of people that literally leave you feeling withered in the corner after half a conversation with them. Yeah. Even those people that seem to hate everything about life, they still don't want to change. It's like they're happy in their little bowl of misery. So it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to, for us to get our head around. We know we've got to change. So many people want to change, but we don't actually want to do that because that will probably mean coming out of our comfort zone. It'll probably mean having to move away from the things that we're used to. And that, I think, is the biggest thing for people, fear of the unknown. It's always been the case for humans. 
that thing that we're not quite sure about is the thing that we seem to worry about most. And I think a lot of that is playing right in when we're, when we're talking about COVID. So I think the idea of change is an interesting dynamic for a leader, for example, which is one of my uh, great areas of interest. You know, we're wanting to create change, but a lot of people don't want it to happen even those people who don't appear to be particularly happy. So it's striking the balance, I think, and, and working out where people are at and working out smart ways to implement change and actually take people on the journey of change. Because we probably know other than something like a lockdown, change isn't an event. It has to be a process. It has to be something that we work through. So let's talk about, you, you mentioned the NHS as one of your clients. Um, Obviously, that's one part of the industry, the health service, that is massively under the pump worldwide. And yeah. you know, we are starting to see some different strategies and then some fracturing of the relationships between world health organizations. Uh, I think we've got the Netherlands going a completely different way to everyone else. Um, we've now had the Americans going one way and New York is just absolutely... Uh, blowing up and maybe that's a cultural issue because New Yorkers uh, you know, I don't want to put them all in the same basket but New Yorkers seem to think that they're bulletproof and we're just going to take this on and we'll survive and 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 this is a different enemy, they haven't had this one before and I think they're really suffering from that bravado a little bit so how as a leader in the health space can you get everybody on the same page or is the solution just not to at all and just look after your own patch? Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's a, a huge, huge question. I mean, I think even if you look in the UK, the various ways that health services operated up and down the UK differs. And I suppose it depends on the philosophy and the science, but I don't suppose that's any different from looking at you know, something like a Microsoft or an Apple, you know, in companies, they're going to have different ways of doing things, but they're hopefully going to be getting some some kind of results. And at the moment, different authorities, health authorities around the world are going to be trying different things and looking at their specialists and their specialists are going to be saying, this is what we think will work for us. Because we don't know a lot about COVID, because it's an unknown thing, I don't think there is the right answer. I mean, I'm saying that a lot in leadership terms, actually, at the moment. I'm not sure how many experts there are actually out there for, for things we haven't come across before. COVID is one of those, you know, how much do we know about it? Not a lot. So who are the experts? I don't know. And I think you've got to rely on specialists and the best place people to make those the best decisions they can with the information they have. They're not always going to get that right. So I think that's one comment to make. I do think there's another side to this, though, Jonathan, which is I think there is huge um, a huge spotlight being put on chronic underfunding in the health services across the world at the moment. I mean, it's not taken a great deal to break the health service. So if you look at the UK, for example, people over here will very often talk about the fact that there's not enough funding put into the National Health Service. I work with uh, a group of lung cancer nurses and I have done for a number of years. And kind of a few years ago when I did my first session with them, they were going, Drew, it's tough out there and we're struggling to, you know, be able to do the work with such such a shrinking of resources. And the year the next year I went back to do, you know, a talk with them on a different topic. And they were saying, you know, we said it was impossible last year. And I'm like, yeah, you did. And they said, well, we've literally had our resource halved again. Now, this was a couple of years ago. I mean, goodness knows where that's actually got to now. And because I think we've not been funding the health services properly, um, I think there's been cracks appearing in it already with the volume that we're already dealing with, with people living longer than ever before and advances in technology, meaning that there's more operations available. And of course, we all want that. If it was one of our loved ones, we, we want them to be cared for. We want them to get the latest treatment. We want the health services to be paying for that. People are going to be living longer. But then you add something like this, that unknown, that uncertain thing like COVID, then you've got a whole set of new pressures and a huge weight being put on a pretty rocky foundation, which are health services across the world. So I think it's exposing 
a number of issues, not just who are the experts. Well, I don't know. Who are the experts? I don't even think the experts know who the experts are. I think they're trying to do the best in really difficult circumstances. I think the bigger question is, what are we going to do about the health services? Not just now, in this time of kind of, we need to get through this point. I do think like anything, there needs to be a post-mortem of this situation where we really get into some detail and say, how can we fund our health service and prepare for something like this that could easily happen again into the future? Yeah, and I think the point is uh, it could happen again in the future and maybe we won't have the funding resources to uh, take care of it the way that we have this time. There is so yeah, much money being pumped into it. Um, and, you know, I think some people think the money is endless when you when it comes to governments, but trust me, they run pretty tight budgets and it can evaporate pretty quick. Um, yeah. So hopefully this is the one and only for the 100 years uh, or That's 200 awesome. or whatever, but uh, who knows. Drew, let's go back. Uh, let's go back in your life. Tell us a little bit about you, uh, what drives you, uh, your purpose. Where did you grow up as a kid? Was there any sort of... Uh, experiences as a child that's that's led you to being one of the leading keynote speakers in the uk that's a big question yeah, well, I, we, ask, we, I only ask big questions on this show well i'm just kind of going where do i even start a bit of, do you want to know a bit about me was yeah that, that's that what it's useful? all about get to know the person behind the microphone and then that'll give us you know a more in-depth look into what you talk about and why you talk about it and where your passions lie yeah, okay. So, I, well, I grew up in Warrington, where I live now. I don't know why I'm doing that. Like, you know where I, where I am, but I'm in, I'm in Warrington. I grew up here. I went to school here, um, primary school just down the road. I'm um, doing it again. And uh, and then I went to Bridgewater, which is up there, which is my secondary school. And to be honest, I wasn't a particularly good student. Uh, I struggled in school. Um, my mum would say I was a challenge. My teachers oh. probably had a different view of that. Yeah. Uh, some people might say I was misunderstood. Others would say I was probably a pain in the backside. But I definitely wasn't the easiest kid in school. Um, I, I think that 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 would be fair to say. Um, and, got and, to what, about, and what drove and what drove that? Do you think? Um, I just struggled with the work. Um, I had an older brother, two years older than me, Ross, who was a genius. He's like a genius, genius kid. So when he went to secondary school, they were kind of like going, oh, this kid's amazing. He's uh, brilliant at English and he's great at maths and he's a fantastic musician. And then they saw there was another Povey coming through and they must have been like, well, happy days. We've got another Povey coming through. And then I turned up and they were like, like, what happened here? Like your brother's like tall and like, good looking and you you've kind of come through and you're not very clever and you're not very tall and and you're not very bright um it must have been a shock to their system and i think it was all because um i couldn't do the work I ju it just didn't seem to go in and it wasn't that um i was deliberately naughty i was never nasty i would never be disrespectful i was just really disruptive and i suppose if i wanted to cock a lesson up i could cock a lesson up pretty easily so i kind of messed about a little bit um through school but then when i got to about yeah, before, year now before you go on did you did you know did you know as a kid that there was that comparison going on and that maybe you weren't living up to the expectations that ross had set uh well uh yeah yeah i did but i was really fortunate i had great parents um still have great parents fortunate to, to have them alive now and they were a great support. You know, they, they always believed in me. I'm not going to say it was a uh, oh, poor Drew and, you know, he had this tough up upbringing because I didn't. I, I absolutely didn't. Um, but I knew there was a bit of a comparison, but I, I, I didn't really care. I was just kind of doing my own thing. And our parents, you know, I was very sporty. Ross was very musical. And our parents encouraged that and kind of, I suppose, the growth mindset, um, the Dr. Carol Dweck stuff, you know, just you work hard at the things you're good at, follow your passions. And we, we had a great upbringing, you know, it was fabulous. So I didn't feel too much pressure there, but what I did know was that I didn't really like school and I wasn't very good at it. And what's interesting in life, isn't it? The things that we're not very good at, we tend to not really like. And um, the irony that I actually became a, um, a, a head teacher and working in education is definitely not 
lost on me. Uh, but probably by the age of year nine, kind of 14, I, uh, I can't tell you that it was a specific moment, but there was a time when I just went, look, I, what I'm going to do with my life here, I'm kind of after going to get my head down and, and do a bit and do something or like, what the hell am I going to do with my life? I wasn't good enough at sport to do it professionally. There'd been a time when I thought maybe I could. That was never going to happen. So I had to get my head down and, and, and work. And it was really interesting because when I kind of went into a uh, year 10, year 11, kind of 15, 16 years old, um, something happened in the maturation process for me in my head, um, not just in terms of mindset, but in terms of my ability to learn. It just seemed to, things started to click. Now, I was working harder and I did absolutely have the, the attitude to, to achieve, but things started to work and I started to understand it. And um, I started to improve in terms of my gradings. Now, around the time of 15, my rugby league coach, and I played a lot of rugby league, said to me, Drew, I've got a great idea. I want you this Saturday to come and do a coaching course. And, and I was kind of taken aback going, Brian, who's a brilliant coach, I still see him from time to time now. I said, Brian, why on earth would I want to spend my Saturday afternoon at a coaching course when I could be on the park drinking White Lightning Cider? And he was kind of like, because it would be good for you, son. So you need to come and do this coaching course. So I said, well, all right. So I went to do this coaching course and I found that I could just do it. I didn't really think about it, it, it whether it was an innate thing. I don't know. But, you know, we had a group of kids there and they were saying, right, we want you to take us through these drills. And I just related to the kids really well, particularly some of the more challenging ones. I kind of felt I had to connect with them. And I started coaching at a very young age, which was good for me because it gave me a bit more responsibility. And then as time went on, I worked really hard towards my GCSEs. Um, I don't think many people expected me to do well, but my two best subjects, don't ask me why, because I don't know the answer to this, were PE, physical education, and RE, um, religious education. Uh, some people say it's because you didn't like writing and you only had to write PE and RE for those two <laughs> subjects. So that's that's why you liked them. But um, they were the two subjects I could do. And, I, and believe it or not, I got A's in them. And um, I don't think anybody expected me to get an A. I didn't expect me to get an A. But what I learned at that time was if I was willing to work hard and really put in the graft. I mean, this is the Angela Duckworth stuff on grit. You know, effort counts twice hair and the tortoise stuff. It's absolutely true. If you're willing to work hard at something, then you can really do something quite incredible. Now, I'm not one of these people that kind of falls for the Anders Ericsson, made famous by Malcolm Gladwell and made famous by Matthew Syed in the UK in the bounce book when we're talking about the 10,000 hours rule. I'm not sure if I spent 100,000 hours, I'm going to become a brain surgeon not happening but i do think in your areas of specialism if you are willing to put the work in you can do some quite interesting things and um, so I, I i did my gcses went on to do my a levels which were in p and re my two favorite subjects which again is a weird mix but it worked for me and i was coaching as well at the time and my coaching really took off and i ended up becoming um a, a scene by Warrington Wolves which was the elite rugby league team in, in the town and they said we want you to come and coach this team Drew we we think it'd be great for you to do one of the um, representative teams in the area we've seen you coaching and I was like oh my goodness like I have arrived I'm being asked by the elite sports team that I go and watch every week to coach one of their junior teams this is amazing and I turned up for the training session for the first team I was to take on and um one of the guys came up to me and said, uh, are you coaching this group of lads here? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I think that's my group. He went, oof, it's a tough group, that. They didn't win one game when they uh, when they played last year. And I was like, well, that's all right. We'll kind of do our best with them. We'll kind of get our heads down. And it was sounds a bit like a Disney story now, but very much I was like, well, you know, we can work hard and we can do the best that we can. That team actually did really well. We we ended up winning a couple of trophies that year. Um, we beat the champions from the uh, season previous to that. 
And we did really well because we focused on some really basic parts of the game. And then I ended up moving up to the academy levels and ended up working with the first team, even when I was 18, 19 years old. Did my A-levels in P&RE. And amazingly, Jonathan, I found a degree that was in PE and RE. No. Yeah, seriously, they actually do do it. In fact, it was in PE, RE, theology, philosophy, and sports science. Wow. Now, that is a mix, isn't it? That is... I, I don't know what job you would apply for at the end with something like that. Maybe a rugby <laughs> playing monk or something <laughs> like that. I don't know. But it's a brilliant degree. I loved it because it was kind of all the things that I wanted to do. And again, I would definitely have to say I'm I'm not really university material. Um, when people would say, oh, imposter syndrome, come on. No, I had to work really hard. Yeah. You know what, university, have you been to university, Jonathan? Sure have. I think almost everyone in Australia goes to university. The rates are, <laughs> are massive. It's, uh, it's almost like party time for a lot of people when you go to university. Okay. So, um... well, well, that's what it's like in the UK. But it, it was not like that for me. There's no way I'd have got a degree if I'd have gone to university and done what everybody else does. Maybe a few lectures, hanging upside down most of the time, drinking day and night. There's no way I'd have passed. Not a cat in hell's chance. So I made the decision. I'm going to stay at home. I lived at home and I travelled in every day and I'd do my lectures in the morning when they were based and then I'd have to go to the um college uh yeah the university library in the afternoon and i'd be working away every single afternoon just having to put the effort in the hours in because i wasn't naturally gifted and and i had to work harder than you know pretty much everybody i think at the university campus you said, but eventually you, got my degree. you sound like one of the most boring guys at uni oh man i was i mean have you not worked that out already from this interview i'm trying to work it out it doesn't fit I'm, I'm you're fully engaged i'm engaged i'm like I could talk to this guy for hours and then you're talking about you used to go and hang out at the library at university. Like, there were, there were girls at your university, right? Yeah, well, yeah, there were. <laughs> but the library was where it was at. Oh, okay. Oh, gee, I must have missed that. I must have missed yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I different. think I missed it too when I was in there. So let's... But yeah, so, so I kind of got through to the end of my degree and then right at the end of my degree, I thought, do I go into sports coaching? Because now I was working with the first team at Warrington Wolves. It was great. I was doing looking at some of the psychology. I was interested in sports supplements and sports nutrition. And I thought, do I go into that or do I go into teaching? I applied late for teaching. I went in to do PE teaching, which I thought was the best fit. They really wanted me to do it, but they said, Drew, you've applied too late. And they weren't going to fund teacher training that year anyway. But long story short, I've walked down the steps um, at the education area and I saw one of my um, philosophy teachers and she's like what are you doing around here Drew and I said oh I was applying to become a PE teacher and it's full and she went oh it's full it's full every year and the waiting list massive I said I know they've, 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 they've just said that thanks and she went um, I've got an idea why don't you become an RE teacher and I kind of went well I just said to her do, do I look like an RE teacher uh, and she went, well, why not? And I thought, come on, like, seriously, we had a bit of a joke about me not owning a tambourine or a, or a rainbow guitar strap or wearing white socks on the sandals or whatever. Um, but no, I, I went home that night and I thought, actually, why not? And then went to the pub with my mates and they were all like, oh, you have got to do that. Now, that would be absolutely brilliant. So I trained as an RE teacher. And you know what? I absolutely loved it. Had some really good, uh, one called Liz Appleton uh, was a mentor for me in my second placement, particularly. She was brilliant, got into it and then went into education. So that's kind of how I ended up coming through. But there were a lot of themes kind of around mindset, effort, kind of growth versus goals, um, hair tortoise type stuff that yeah. I've kind of squashed into a rather long dialogue of 10 years of my life. I think that's important to note too, is that, um, you know, no matter which religion you follow, because um, there's so many of them right around the world, is that um, there are great lessons in religion and they're time tested. 
uh, thousands of years and there aren't that many uh, things in the world that have been as time tested as the lessons that come in religion of all shapes and sizes. Um, tell us about how that then moved you into the leadership space and what can people do with you know, what you teach from stage to help them through the times that they're dealing with now? Yeah, so it's a good point you make about religion. You know, whilst people will sometimes go, oh, RE, why would you do RE? What's the point in that? What are you going to learn? Well, actually, in leadership terms, you know, there's a lot of great leaders have come through, you know, the the, 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 the tradition and, and the teachings from RE. And um, I... I think there's it's an interesting um, it's an interesting dynamic, isn't it, between kind of the religion and the thinking and the philosophy and the theology side and the sports science. Now, this was never by design, by the way. So don't need to think, oh, you've been extremely clever, Drew, and designed and something that was extremely strategic. But the two do clash well. If you think about kind of the performance element of sport, and sport is very, very performance driven and very scientific and looking at the empirical. And then you're kind of bringing the thinking side of kind of theology and philosophy then actually you do get quite a nice match of leadership, I suppose. And that's really what, what got my head into getting interested in leadership because when I was coaching a, a team or I was working with an elite athlete and I ended up working with England Rugby Union and Wales Rugby Union and kind of the, the uh, list went on um, and, and has gone on and on in sport. And when you're teaching a class of kids, you're actually doing the same thing. And this is what I was kind of really interested in, that it's the same set of skills, slightly nuanced, slightly different, but that's actually a leadership role. And if you think about what you've got to do as a coach or as a teacher or as a business leader, you've got to challenge people. You've got to support people. You've got to communicate with people. You've got to get people to believe in themselves. You've got to give people a vision of the future bigger and better than they thought was ever possible. And you've got to create a set of values and rules that people stick to. You know, these are interchangeable skills. What I noticed was, was that the various sectors didn't really talk to each other. So sport do some incredible things around performance and performance analysis. And obviously some fantastic things around teams, you know, some really good stuff on teams. What teachers do in a classroom in terms of learning and pedagogy and actually creating strong relationships that last the test of time. Well, that's actually incredible. Then some of the things you see in business in terms of focusing on, on various elements of the business and looking at really significant incremental improvements that will be part of a matrix that will give us an overall boost or, or some of the work that's done in terms of curiosity and innovation and transformation. There's so much can be learned from each sectors. What I started to see was that the sectors don't share a great deal amongst themselves. Education probably being the one where people are least likely to learn from because we went through school. We just let them get on with the, you know, the lessons that they teach and they, you know, they make things, don't they? And they do some exams. There's a lot to be learned from what teachers do in classrooms. Yeah, that's really interesting uh, that you, that you do talk about that in that as you were speaking, I was like, yeah, we look at sporting leagues like the AFL. They've, the AFL has actually led the way here really with COVID, to be honest. I'm going to talk about what's relevant today and the triggers. Um, yeah. yeah, They shut the league down. Um, they've done testing. They've set up all these things. And then business has sort of been lagging behind, almost trying to, hang on and, and squeeze every dollar out. I mean, we did have one round of football here and that was a little bit controversial, the first round of, yeah, that, that's, that's, of the um, yeah. of the year. But as soon as it became you know, clear of what we were dealing with, and I think it was that let's get to Easter mentality that you mentioned earlier, once they realised that that wasn't going to work, the AFL has led pretty strongly um, with how to sort of guide through this. And, and, and you know, it was almost shown the politicians up in a way uh, yeah. so it is interesting that you say that that you know we should be looking at different sectors and i think what's going to happen after this is that 
we're going to be looking a lot more at the health sectors and and how those workers really have and hospitals have really shown great leadership uh particularly here at the moment we were heading for a massive uh storm uh, the government was was on the front foot early but then sort of got a bit a bit confident i think and sort of eased yeah. things and i don't know if you've heard but there was a big cruise ship with i think there was 200 people who had um symptoms and then they let the cruise ship pull up in sydney harbour and yeah, then they so just let those people off for the day you know go yeah, walk yeah. around the city and now you know they, they can't put the toothpaste back in the tube so to speak yeah so yeah it is interesting that you know you look at the different industries and the way they're leading and and i think there has to be a greater encouragement uh to to look at each other and and learn i was really yeah. fascinated by your article in forbes uh just recently yeah. can you take us through yeah. that because i think that had some really clear advice about the three steps that people can take to deal with what they're dealing with i know yesterday as soon as they said we've got term two at home so all of a sudden I, i'm you know this office here becomes a prep classroom uh yeah. my lounge room is <laughs> going to become a year seven classroom and yeah. you know my uh, my grade five she's probably just going to be running off an ipad somewhere and yeah. out of all that i've got to i've got to find somewhere for my business um yeah. sorry we've gone black to wear but it will be right so i've got to find somewhere for my business to work uh from it's going to be tough and i got anxious and, and i started to worry about things and i was like how are we going to do this and it was all things that i didn't have to yeah, you know, there. Once I got to about halfway through the day, and I just sat there, and I took a moment and said, "Well, I can't control it." And then, and, yeah. and it was, it, I went back to your article and and followed those steps for. So, for the people watching and listening, can you share that the the bones of that article with them, and and what they can do to avoid being stuck in this cycle? I suppose. Yeah, so I strip it back just before I go to the article, if we've got time, because I I don't think people understand what leadership is. Um, I, I really don't. I think we have this idea. If I ask an audience when I'm doing a talk, shout out great leaders, they'll shout out Winston Churchill, or they'll shout out Barack Obama, or Richard Branson, or Steve Jobs. Um, and that's normally the kind of set of leaders you get it might be different in different cultures but by and large they're the kind of stock set of answers you get and what i say to that is well the first thing i've got to comment on is they're all men um occasionally you get somebody at the back of a room that will shout thatcher and then duck down um <laughs> you know because they, they might not want to be seen to be saying that but they they will talk about ma male leaders and every one of those people that we've mentioned there, they might mention a religious leader like uh, Gandhi. They all have positions of authority to some extent. And that's not really what leadership is. Leadership is not about a position that somebody holds. John Maxwell, leadership authority in the world, says leadership's not about position. It's about permission. It's about people giving you permission to lead. So people say, well, who would you say is a great leader? And I would say, well, someone like Mother Teresa. You know, she she didn't have the big highfalutin C-suite job. She was a nun. And she didn't choose to work in one of the most incredible areas you could be a nun like the Vatican. She worked in the slums of Calcutta. But when she stood up and she spoke at the G8 summit, she literally had everybody in the palm of a hand. You could hear a pin drop. She had significant influence. And just because we're a government official, or we are a head teacher, or we're the head coach, or we're the CEO, or we're a police chief, you know, that doesn't make you a leader. It puts you in a position of leadership, but it doesn't make you a leader. And I think what we're going through at the moment is, we're seeing different people standing up, Jonathan, and being leaders. We will see people in their families stand up and being leaders. There's a guy just down the road from us here who started a community radio show to keep people connected who might be on their own. That's leadership. That's influence. Some people are doing leaflet drops locally. That's leadership. That's influence. So I think we've got to clear that bit up first is the first thing I've got to say. Then when we're talking about 
this COVID issue, we've got to understand that we are dealing with a crisis. And I get concerned about the fact when people talk about crises, because very often the research that's written on this, people talk about crisis management. And in the article in Forbes that you're talking about, I'm really clear at the beginning when I was doing that interview and that article was we need to be talking about crisis leadership. It's going to be very hard to manage something. There's going to be, we're going to need to do some managing. There's lots of things we've got to do and keep a lid on stuff. But we need to lead people to stay indoors. We need to lead people to do the right actions. It's going to be quite hard to make people do the things we need to do. And actually, we're going to need our NHS to lead us through this really difficult and dark time. So it's a leadership job, which is about people. The other thing I'm going to say about a crisis before I go on to the AAA model, if we've got time, is that crisis raises up huge uncertainty. So you said a moment ago, you know, I'm going to have all my rooms of my house is going to become a part of a school and I'm trying to run a business at the same time. Now, what does uncertainty do? Well, uncertainty, we know, first off, will raise levels of worry. And worry really comes from your current circumstances, like you're thinking, oh my goodness, like I've not even got enough rooms in my house. You'll start to worry. But then you might look a bit further down the track going, actually, how is this going to work? And if we can't go out of the house, are, are, are there going to be, is there going to be enough food? Are we going to be able to cope? What's going to happen work-wise? Will money be coming in? And that worry very quickly becomes fear. And fear is really linked to what happens in the future. And then the final bit that's really going to be starting to kick in soon, I believe, is that the worry in the current circumstances leads to fear in the future, eventually will lead to full-blown anxiety. And I think the health services are as worried, not quite as worried, but are extremely concerned about the mental health and well-being of people because people are worrying, they are nervous and they are fearful. So this does mean that as leaders, all of us being leaders, by the way, because we all have influence over someone or something, we're going to have to step up to the plate. And what we do know in times of crisis is that it's showtime for leaders. This is when leaders have to step up and do their thing. And if you get this right, where there's some people done some brilliant things at the moment and we're going like, wow, our NHS frontline workers, my goodness me, take a bow. I don't know if you're doing it in Oz, but eight o'clock every Thursday night, the whole of the UK is out and we're cheering and clapping and there's fireworks going off. We're all standing on our doorsteps cheering our NHS heroes and they are leading the way forward. And that's going to be absolutely crucial for us at the time. But also within our businesses, how our business leaders behave at this time, at this moment, is going to tell us an awful lot about what that business stands for. So I don't know if you read in the press what happened with a lot of Virgin staff over in the UK, but they literally at the start of the COVID crisis said, sorry, guys, I think it was 800 to 1,000 staff, all of you go home unpaid leave for two months we can't afford to pay you you haven't got a job for the next two months wow. now virgin have got a real problem now because the furlough schemes come over in the uk and they could have furloughed the staff they didn't they took a decision and they're not going to be able to backpedal from that if you listen to what liverpool football club did the other day they took a lot of their staff even though they are extremely wealthy and furloughed a lot of the um, non-playing staff. They've been hammered for that. People are saying, you have the money not to draw down from government in this crisis. That is really a poor set of values. So people are watching what you're doing. But then there's other companies that are doing amazing things and the NHS are doing amazing things. So I say to people, during a crisis, you're on the stage. The spotlight is on as a leader and people are watching what you are doing. And John Maxwell, I'll quote him again, because it's a brilliant quote. A lot of people say a crisis makes a leader. And he says a crisis doesn't make a leader. A crisis reveals a leader. Yeah. It shows what people are really made of. And I think we're seeing that across the world at the moment. We're seeing what people are really made of during this tough time. And you find that out during the tough times. 
So that was my soapbox moment on crisis. Do you want me to get onto the model now? Well, I think that's really. I, I just want to make one point. I think, and I think this is important to people who are watching, is that you know you can just be a leader in your neighbourhood. You can be a My leader word. in your household. Oh, you, yeah. you don't have to be yeah. in front of all the cameras and, and swinging around with big dollars. You just you can stand up and be a leader for your family so that they f don't suffer the anxiety and the stress. That and that doesn't. Yeah, you know, I don't think leaders are immune to that sort of feeling. It's just they they can operate with it or beyond it. Is that would that be a fair? Well, no. Yeah, but or not. Or, you know, some leaders are making big mistakes now and some families will be making big mistakes. But we've got to go back to that fundamental. A leader is someone who has influence. Again, I'll quote John Maxwell just because he's the number one leadership author in the world at the moment. He says leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. It's influence. Mother Teresa did not have the position, like you say, in the big high dollar job, not on the TV screens, not on that. But she was a leader. Mm. There are people in our local area who are leading. There are NHS workers now who are the leaders. They're influencing what is happening to people's lives daily. And we've got to be the leaders of ourselves. We've got to lead ourselves well. And we've got to lead our families well and those people around us. We've got to do the Ken Blanchard stuff. We've got to do the leadership by example and do that thing called servant leadership, which was a guy by um, uh, a guy called Robert Greenleaf talked about a number of years ago. Leadership is going to be the thing that gets us through. That's why I'm so passionate. Let's not just talk crisis management. Let's talk about crisis leadership. That hits us all. And really, that's all about what we do with people. Yeah. Well said. So let's get through. Let's uh, let's get on to the three steps. What are the three steps that people who are suffering this um, can take in your mind? The the three the three Drew Povey pieces of gold that people can take with them watching this podcast. Well, I'll I'll tell you my three elements, and you might have to dig for some of the gold in this, Jonathan, no, but I'll do... I, I read I'll it, do, I, I read it, and I reread it again last night, that article, and I was like, yeah, this... this, this When you couldn't sleep, <laughs> you were using it as a sleeping aid. Yeah, no, no, I didn't, no, 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 don't be cheeky, don't be cheeky. Uh, I've got control of this uh, vodcast, remember, okay. I, can, I can do things. No, no. Sorry, so you can see how we're going in trouble at school now. Yeah, no, I love it. We're, I think we're very similar. Uh, I, yeah. I equally wasn't great at school, but... Um, oh, really? No, no. Two very smart older brothers, and uh, yeah, no, I was a bit of a, I was a bit of a. Uh, I just liked having a good time. I think I'm a social beast, so lockdown's hard for me because I like to be social and out and about. I, you know, it's it's going to be interesting. Skype bear. Skype bears the future. I've been telling everyone about it. Just get get all your mates on a Skype call or a Zoom call or a or a Teams call, Microsoft Teams, and just have a bear. Yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, no, you don't even have to leave your there's, house. There's a lot. There's a, there's a lot of those groups popping up now. Uh, the Friday night drink groups and stuff like that. And, yeah, yeah. It's, Pop quizzes. Yeah, and, hallelujah. Yeah, and with my kids, uh, particularly my youngest, you know, I'm always walking past, and they're on. She's on. Uh, she's got all her schoolmates on FaceTime, and you know, yeah, on her iPad, and there's just yeah, you know, and they float around in bubbles, and whoever's speaking, their bubble gets bigger, and yeah, they'd be. <laughs> There'd be 14, 15 kids on there. So, yeah, they're just learning Great, to communicate differently. And Yeah, yeah. My wife and I were saying to them last night, imagine you know, if this had happened in the 80s and we were locked out, like you would not be seeing your school friends for 10 weeks, 12 weeks, three months. Uh, we'd have been using like carrier pigeons or something like that, wouldn't we? <laughs> would have written notes on tennis balls and thrown them over the fence, right? Yeah, exactly that. I never did that actually, but it's a good idea. No, so so take us through the three steps, the three pieces, yeah. the three pieces of gold. They're in there. I re, as I said, I reread it last night. I went, you know what? This article actually helped me through today. And that's oh, well, thank that's you. all. That's and that's all we need to do at the moment. I think is, you know, a good friend of mine and a mentor. He's a best-selling author by the name of Rick Rushton. He put a post, yeah. and he's mates with a friend of yours as well, Paul McGee. Um, yeah, no, Paul, he, great guy. He put a post on um, LinkedIn the other day, which was uh, times like these is it's like driving at night. 
Okay, you can't see what's around the next corner. You can only see what's in the headlights. So just focus on that, and you'll stay on the road. Yeah. And and that's right. Don't wor- don't worry yourself about what's going to happen in two or three months' time. Right now, all you got to worry about is how do you get to tomorrow. Yeah, that's it. I mean, that's that's a life rule, isn't it? If we're being honest, we all get bent out of shape about what could, maybe, if this happened, and sliding doors and serendipity and these all stars aligned for this one second in the future. And most of the time, it doesn't really happen. Just focus on what's in front of you. When I work in sport, we say, don't we, play what's in front of you. You know, you can have a plan, great, but play what's in front of you. Yeah. And it's a, it's, it's a great way to look at life. So I love creating leadership models. Um, I read still for an hour a day on leadership. And I'm fortunate that I've seen loads of the sectors, sport, police, business, NHS, education. And I've created models um, that I think will help people during certain times. So I've written leadership models and culture models and change models, um, written a couple of books on that kind of thing. But when this first happened, the first thing I wanted to talk about was crisis, which I've already had my soapbox moment about. But then I was thinking to myself, how are people going to go through this? Because crisis leadership is not an event. It's not a one-off thing. We don't just do crisis leadership and go, jobs are good and we're done now. Let's go home and have some tea. It's kind of like, no, actually, this is an ongoing process and it's going to go on for a while as things shift and change and uncertainty continues to rise. So I thought there were three things that we really have to help people go through. And that's self-leadership. The hardest person you ever lead is yourself. And it's also leadership of people in your family or it might be a friend or it might be a neighbor or it might be a whole corporate business. Okay. and the first element I talk about is acceptance. I think we've got to try and get people just to press pause for a minute and acknowledge the moment in time that we're actually in. This is a global pandemic. This is a worldwide crisis. So it's not just happening to us. This is happening across the board. And we have to accept that there's certain things in life that we can't control. Now, that is a big problem for human beings. Because of these things that we have, our mobile phones, we're literally in control of everything, and we love being in control. We like to have what's known as the locus of control. When something goes outside of our control, that's when we start to get a bit edgy. What's happened with the coronavirus is loads of stuff that was in our locus of control has gone outside. And we're going to have to get our heads around this, just like your friends said. Look, focus on what what you've got in front of you, what you can control. You've got the steering wheel in your hands. You've got your foot on the pedal. You've got the gears in your hand if it's not an automatic. You know, you're in charge of what is happening. Control the controllables. Control what you can. And that's about acknowledging where we are. And it's also about looking at, okay, well, If I can control those things, if you can control your household as a mini school and run your business, well, that's what you focus on because that's what you can do. Well, you're not going to be able to affect COVID-19 and there's not many people that are going to be able to affect COVID-19. But we have to focus down on what we can control and, of course, be mindful of that uncertainty and literally go from day to day. Right. What have I got to accept today? Where am I today? And what can I control? And the interesting thing about that is, is that I have heard some leaders saying things like the famous Simon Cowell saying, it is what it is. Guys, we are where we are. And that, that is about as much use as rabies in a dog's home. Because you just saying to people, just get with the program, kind of come on, what's wrong with you? Stiffer up a lip, come on, let's kind of get into this. That won't work. We have to kind of take people through it. And it's a bit like uh, the grief phases of uh, the phases of, of grief or, or, or the grief curve, where we have to kind of go through denial and anger and kind of bargaining and then depression and then get to a point of acceptance. But we've got to try and get somewhere along that track. Does that one make sense? Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. So that's the first thing I think we've got to try and get people to accept. It's a worldwide thing. Lots of things we can't control, but actually there's a lot more we can control than we realize. Second thing we've then got to do is say, OK, bearing in mind things are different, then we're going to have to start to do phase two, which is the adaptation. We're going to have to adapt to our surroundings. So if I say Charles Darwin, do you know who he was? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Evolution, yeah. origin of species. Yeah. He had a famous saying, survival of the... Fittest. Yes. But that's not really what he meant. Uh, it's kind of been used and, and taken out of, out of, um, out of context okay. because it, it wasn't really about survival of the strongest and you know because if that was the case dinosaurs would be roaming the earth mm -hmm. what he meant was was it was survival of the ones that could fit best the ones that uh, could adapt oh, wow. now human beings do not like to adapt let's be clear the change stuff we talked about earlier the only people like change is a baby with a dirty nappy and that's not even true it's people do don't like to adapt they don't like to not have control but we are actually really good at it. If you think about how we've evolved, our bodies have evolved, how, how we have come through over the thousands and thousands of years, we are really good at adapting. We just don't like it. So when we're in this adaption phase, we have to look at two areas, I think, that we're going to have to adapt. One is how we think. We're going to have to think differently about our lives, think differently about our businesses, think differently about the way we do things. And we're also going to have to do things differently. Like I love meeting with people. It's a real challenge for me now to live in a virtual world where I'm talking to a, a picture of you on a, on a screen. It's not quite the same for me. No. I'm going to have to adapt to that. I'm going to have to think differently about that. I'm going to have to adapt my skill set to be able to fit within my new environment if I'm going to survive. And we don't just want to survive. Of course, we want to thrive. Then a lot of companies have said, OK, Drew, we kind of get it. We need to get people to the accept level. We need to get people to adapt within their business because one of the worst things you can do with a business is say, you guys go home, work from home, just do things in the same way, but work from home. That's not going to work because they're not going to do exactly the same things in the same way at home. And it's not going to have the same functionality. So we are going to have to do things different. And how do we go about doing the adapting? Well, like everything in life, we have to experiment. We have to play around with it. There's a really good book by a guy called um, Tim Harford, who uh, the book's called Adapt. And he said, actually, human beings experiment with things. And when we experiment and play around with things, that's when we start to adapt. We start to realize what we can do. And that's within the thoughts and the actions. And the final bit, if we can get people to accept it, and then we can get people to start to adapt to this new way of life that we're living in at the moment and kind of working within it and experimenting and finding new ways of having pub quizzes and, and, and Skype beers and all the other bits that go with that. The final bit to put in place, I think, is the final A is ambition. You know, I'm saying to a lot of business leaders at the moment, just because we're having to do things differently, just because we've not got people in the office or on the sports field or in the same school does not mean that we drop our standards. Just because a family is on lockdown does not mean that we drop our standards. It doesn't mean that we just decide to drink beer all day, even though the thought of that for some people might be a utopia. It doesn't mean that we're eating chocolate all day and we just completely ignore our diets. We can't afford to lose our ambition within our businesses or within our lives. The values that we hold, the things that we know are important, those things have got to stay in place. I did a social media piece on Monday saying, look, we could all go a bit stir crazy being in the house, but what are people doing to plug routine back into their life. And some of the things I got back were brilliant. Like, you know, you've still got to get up at the same time. There's a load of people who are getting dressed and, and into the work clothes and going into their home office, but as if it's a work day and they're having the breaks and the lunch and they're keeping that level of uh, routine. But more importantly, they're not dropping their standards. And the final bit of ambition is about the belief sets that we hold. I, I really am passionate that belief is a 
hugely important part of life and we do not tap into it well enough in our schools, in our sports teams, in our businesses, in our health services, in our police forces and, 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 and. We don't do it well enough, I don't think. But the other part of ambition is we are going to get through this. Let's be clear, we are, as human beings, going to get through this. This is not going to wipe us out. It is going to be hard. It is going to be horrible. It will be horrific. There will be abhorrent things that we will experience. We will lose loved ones without a question of a doubt. Those things are going to happen. But what we can't forget is that collectively we will get through this. Like Solomon said, this too shall pass. That's my RE teacher bit for you yeah. on the end. It's true. So I've talked to lots of leaders about this. I'm saying it's a cycle. And there was one guy I coached through and, and he did it all in a really nice succinct speech. He just said, look, I don't like where we are, but we have to accept there's a lot of change in the world and a lot of things we can control and we can't control. And I realize that gives us some uncertainty, but please bear with us. We're going to have to adapt the way we do things in the business. We might have to furlough some people, but we really want to work with you to think differently about the business, to operate the business differently. We want you to help us think of new ways of doing things. And the biggest thing for me is please don't lose your ambition. This business has the same values, the same beliefs, the same vision. 